Welcome to Gone Fishing. Today we're in southwestern Saskatchewan chasing the elusive brown trout. Your host Bob Kirkpatrick dons his camouflage gear to get close to the action. We also talk to local fisheries about stream enhancement and resource management, so stay with us. Well, Gerald, we didn't manage to get anything out of those little pools. No, they're nice looking pools, but they're just not very active today. Welcome to Gone Fishing. I'm Bob Kirkpatrick. We're on Bone Creek. It's uh, south of Gull Lake. It's a little stream that runs out of the Cypress Hills. I've got Maple Creek fly fisherman Gerald Chabot with me, and he's going to show us some of his fly fishing techniques. We're after brown trout. It's uh, mid-October. It's really not the prime time to be fishing for browns, but Jill thinks we're going to get a few, and hopefully. I hope, well, hopefully we will. We're going to try some more pools further up the creek, so stay with us. Now, Gerald, when you're fly fishing, I know these brown trout, the small ones, feed primarily on insects. What? How do you decide what kind of fly or which fly you're going to use? Well, on a real bright day during the day, you'd look for rises and emergers coming out, but uh, today's pretty dull, so we'll look down in the stream bed, and maybe we can find a caddis fly or what. So just pick or up a helgramite or something that we're you know, we'll just pick up a rock and we'll have a look at it. Usually, oh yeah, there's something right there on the bottom of this here one. Here we are, right here. Now, what what is that? This is a caddis nymph, a stick caddis. Yeah. Now, inside of this little barky-looking case here is a little insect that lives. And if you push this, these paws should come out. Oh up. yeah, there's there he is. There he is. Now so to try and imitate that, we'll have to uh, use a caddis stick nymph and. Uh, I just happen to have a pattern in my box here that cover that pretty closely. Now those, I know, I've seen those caddis flies on, on northern lakes or northern streams and they're a lot bigger. They, they, yeah, they're, they're very sized. Like even on the streams here, uh, this would be a real small one. So you got imitations Imi tied up in different sizes? Yeah, different then. sizes for them, yeah. And it's, uh, here would be the uh, the bigger caddis nymph, this little one here. Uh-huh. And uh, it's got the eyes on it. The little eyes, yeah. They imitate coming out of the case and the little feelers. And you just float that down or work it's, it down on the You just the, work it down like in a, in a gravel on a shallow pool like this. You throw it up into the head of the pool and let it drift through naturally. And hopefully a trout will take it. Now we got a, you're going to try a little smaller one here since the... Absolutely. I have uh, little smaller ones tied up here to imitate. This is about a size, oh, 16 or 18. Well, that's so closer good. to what we're looking at that's here. That's more like what we're looking at, yeah. Now I'm using spinning gear, and uh, I know I can fish a fly with spinning gear, but I'm going to stick to more traditional methods here. What would you suggest that I use? Well, I would suggest uh, Len Thompson number seven or number eight, uh, red five of diamonds. Would probably imitate a little brown trout. Might work real good. You know, the uh, Len Thompson spoon, you can catch just about anything. I've caught walleye, pike, just about anything you can imagine. I'm sure it'll work for brown trout as well. I think it will too. Now what I'm trying to do here, I'm going to sneak up on this pool. Uh, hopefully there's a brown trout feeding in the riffles up here. I'm going to try and get my fly up where the fast water breaks into this pool and let it drift in underneath the bank. And hopefully he'll come out from underneath that tree and uh, hit the fly. Now we're going to uh, start our cast with a little back cast. We'll get some false casting. We'll get some line out. Try and guess to where we're at and then drop it in there and let the water do the rest. Drift it in underneath that pool. Strip the line in, make sure it's tight all the time. Well, if we can't get one out of this pool, we'll move up the creek, let it drift under there again. No action, I'll move up ahead, try this pool. Let the bug drift down. Pick it up. 
We keep moving. Sometimes these browns are in the shallow water. Sometimes they're deep. We'll try the deep water. We we'll fish it as we go. We'll uh, start at the tail end of the pool here and just keep working our way up into the deeper water. Now brown trout are the wariest of all trout. You have to be real careful when you're coming up to a to the stream to fish them. You got to be quiet. They uh, can sense a lot of vibration through their lateral line, and that's how they find their food and, and keep away from predators. So you have to be very quiet when you're coming up. It's a good idea when you move into a new spot just to sneak in and sit and wait for a couple minutes before you make a cast and let everything settle down. And we've got a bunch of little beaver ponds in here, and the, the trout are sitting in the deeper water. We've had a big cold front come through, and they're trout. these trout are known for being surface feeders, but right now they're They've got to be right down on the bottom. We just aren't getting much action with the lures or the fly right now. But you have to be careful. That's why I'm dressed the way I am. Brown or real drab colors, camouflage is a really good idea because these trout have excellent vision. And uh, trout have a, can see above the surface. They have a, a window of vision that they can see quite a bit above the surface. Now these trout are also very color oriented and uh, any bright colors will spook them off that they see above the water. Now how this window of vision works is they can see about two and a half times more area. It's in a circular pattern than the depth they are. So for example, if they're, if they're down about two feet and the water's nice and clear, they can see an area of about four and a half feet around. So if you're standing up on the bank, they can see you and, and they'll spook. They spook real easy. So it's a good idea to stay low, wear drab colors, and try and keep something like this, these weeds or some brush between you and the stream. Makes it a little more difficult for fishing, but it's the only way you're gonna get out these browns. And they're quite likely they're gonna be laying under a snag or a piece of deadfall or, or an undercut underneath the bank. They're very wary and they're very territorial. They'll, they'll stay in the same spot day after day and even year after year will be occupied by, you know, big browns or have, uh, are more territorial than the small ones and they'll pick a spot and they'll stay there. Even if a fish is caught and released, it'll go back to that spot. You can come back next week and, and get a chance at catching it again. So, you know, just a couple of, of ideas. Be real quiet and be careful and uh, don't wear any bright colors. Now these fish are, uh, the only time they will move out of their areas like that is at spawning time and then they go back to these same spots again unless something uh, like flooding or um, silting or something will, will chase them out of their area. They'll stay in that same spot for a long time. Okay, there we are. Little brownie. Just wade in and I'll grab it here and take the hook out. Trying to revive him here, he's pretty weak. Water's cold, he's not generating very fast. Yeah, he's starting to get a little stronger. Nice little fish, about a pound. I don't know about him, but my hand is cold. You gonna go there, big guy? Come on, come on. There he goes, he's gone. Lots of fun, nice fish. Now we're on a section of Bone Creek where the fisheries department has uh, done some enhancement projects. And we're gonna show you some of these. I've got fisheries uh, regional biologist Ron Jensen here from Swift Current. And Ron, you've been involved with a lot of the enhancement projects on Bowen Creek. And we happen to be in an area that uh, has been worked over. Can you kind of explain what's been done and on this section and, and some of the other sections of Bowen Creek? Uh, this particular section of Bowen Creek with the cooperation of the landowner, which is absolutely essential. We can't do any work on these creeks without landowner cooperation. We've been able to install some stream bank covers, that, what we're standing on right at the moment. And this bank cover goes all the way around up the corner, and it's, the, the bank cover itself is about 
this wide. Uh, we've got, as you can see, rocks on top, uh, on top of a wooden planking, and then we've regrassed the area. And that part is essential that you can see the stream bank used to be quite wide here mm -hmm. and it was shallow. This is, is forced the stream to be, to be narrower. It's got worked itself a little deeper. This provides a better uh, volume of water for the trout to be in. Also gives them a place to hide. So there's a whole shelf under so here. There's a whole open. bank underneath here that he can come and sit under here like he would on a natural undercut stream. And when he wants something to eat, he just comes out and has lunch. Uh, and as you can see, we're in a pool area, which is immediately below a riffle area. And that's where you're going to find your nice big brown trout. So you're in prime brown trout prime habitat. Prime brown trout habitat. The other thing that we've done here is that with the cooperation landowner, we fenced off the creek. And we've got fences on both sides. Uh, the landowner controls the gating of when he can let his livestock in. He'll lay it on here to, to graze the area for a short period of time, and then the cattle go out. So this is to protect any overgrazing so you don't get a bunch right, of... Right, uh, so we don't get trampling of the bank and, and actual dis destruction of the bank covers we put in. The whole hope is that, that some of the trees will grow up, the grass will grow up tall, and we'll get a canopy over and further shade the creek and keep it cool. Brown trout are a cool, cooler water. They like, they like some cool water to live in. They also like the shade. And with a helper hanging vegetation, we also get more food into the creek because the insects climb, climb up and fall in. So all this work that's done now, is it a lot of volunteer help from the landowners and from other people that are interested in the fishery? This was a cooperative project between landowner and the uh, East End Wildlife Federation. Fisheries branch provided the funding for the materials uh, and the landowner and the Wildlife Federation provide the manpower to have it all installed. Well, you, now you were mentioning to me earlier there, there's some areas that haven't been enhanced that have had some some problems, uh, some problem areas, and we should maybe go and have a look at that and just see what the difference is. Now, Ron, this is one of the areas that you were talking about that could use a little bit of control or a little bit of work on. Yeah, it. and as you can see here, that the cattle have been in along the stream. Naturally, they want to get out the stream to have a drink, and that's understandable. But with this high bank like this, they keep eroding it off and pushing it down in the stream. The, st the stream ends up with all the dirt and rubble and grass in there. And, and it, the cobble is fine because it adds spawning area, but all the dirt and stuff plugs up the spawning area and the cobble and just plugs up everything solid. You can see the cattle have been in here lots. And there's just no end to this. In fact, you got to make a big step to get across here. And well, there's some areas too where the grass is all tramped down and, yep. and see the bank is eroded away there so all this dirt's washing in there yep. and silting in areas, uh, good spawning areas. Certainly. And then walking along the edge of the bank, it destroys the overhangs that, that are established with undercut banks so the fish have got no place to hide underneath the bank and everything collapses in and then you just got this short fat stream that just goes whipping down. With, with a little bit of, of cooperation with the landowner, we, they could get uh, a good watering area for the cattle. The cattle wouldn't have to be trying to negotiate this kind of area. I think we could help everybody out. Well, you can sure see the difference from here to where you've done the work and there's yep. been some control. You've been, and it definitely makes a difference. It certainly is just like night and day. Now we just saw a fish work in an area right up here. I'm going to try and sneak around, stay low get a cast in in front of him. I've got a night crawler on. I'm going to try and drift it down through where he is. Now, we don't know if he's feeding in there or making a, a red for spawning, but I've seen him flipping around four or five times. So I'm going to just try and stay low here and out of his sight and get up far enough that I can put a cast in there. This is more like whitetail hunting than it is fishing. There, you see it? See the swirls there now? Hope you didn't see me. I hope I can cast from being down here. I'm only going to get one or two chances. It's a little further than where he was, but maybe that current will carry it down there. I'm trying to cast upstream for a little bit. If I go too far, I'll be snagged up and I'll lose everything. He went after it. Well, I thought she was going to take it that time. Swirl came right after the crawler. I don't know if she's protecting her nest area and just not interested in eating or what. But as you can as you can see, it's still swirling around in there. I haven't spooked her away. I think she's 
obviously in the rocks they're digging a, a nest. Well, Gerald, that fish doesn't seem to be interested in this crawler. I'm going to keep trying to drift it over there, but you may as well flip a, a fly or something up in front and see if that'll... Let's try and drop it in just ahead of it there. Well, I'm going to go behind you and drift this crawler through. Oh, there. It's gone up the stream now. And we're going to just keep moving up to the next pool. I think there's a, a beaver dam up ahead. Those fish seem to be holding right at the back end of the pools and in the riffles at spawning time. We've seen lots of areas where they've started moving the gravel around and making their, uh, their reds for spawning. And we've chased a few out. They're really hard to get at because they're so shallow. And this is all new to me, trying to cast in amongst all these bushes and grass and stuff. I'm having a little bit of trouble with it, but I'll get one yet. Why do you suppose that last fish wasn't interested in the bait? Just, for, just because of the heavy spawning spawn. time? They're, uh, more protective. They, uh, in fact, they're pretty thin right now from the pre-spawn there. I must have got this out into a, a little bit of a back eddy. It isn't drifting down at all, or else it was hung up on something. Pick it up and let the current. There. Oh, I just had a bump. There, I got one. Good man. Not big, but it's a brown. It's a brown. Yeah. The net man. <laughs> well, we've got a perfect spot here. I can oh, you bet. Bring that up to you on the rocks. It's a nice, nice fish. You ready yet? Boy, well, they sure are pretty. There it is, guy. There we are. Great, I think I got the line tangled around you. I think I'm gonna have to get that crawler out of there to find the hook. It's just about out. Nice fish. Well, that's what we came for. Yeah. Now, before you let that go, just hold it in the water for a sec. <laughs> Without the glove, it's Without the glove. I'll let my hands. Let me see if I can... I'll probably lose it here, but... Ah, <laughs> we'll try. Now, see the nice colors on that? There's uh, some certain ways to tell these browns from, from some of the other trout. With the black spots and then the, the reds. They're sure colorful now. It's really ha time. haloed out in that the blue purple. whitish. Yeah. Halos around the red spots. So is this, is this a, a normal size, average size? Average trout? size trout for this for this creek. That's I would say that's about what you would catch. But eight and tens are in here. Are common, yeah, very common. Well, I waited a long time to get this one, and uh, he's in pretty good shape. And I'll let her nice get back in the water. No worse for wear. No. Well, that's great. So that's what you call a trout pool. <laughs> now I don't imagine there's any chance of getting another one out of here after a, well, a fight like that and we've been waiting around. Waiting around, yeah, they're they're pretty spooky. Just move on up to the next one and go to the next that. hole and try that one. Well great, that was a lot of fun. They're scrappy for the size of them. Yeah, they put up a good battle. Oh that looks like a good one, Gerald. Nice looking brown. Nice fish. I'd say four pounds. Nice male. Oh, there he goes again. It's going to be tough to land him here, but I think I can get in the water. Well, it was tough getting here with all these, all this bush here. This is what I said, this trophy water, this. Oh, that is a beautiful fish. Nice fish. I'm going to bring him in here. That's a male, isn't it? That's a male. Yeah. It's a nice male brown. You got that on a on a little Len Thompson. Little Len Thompson. Well, in this deep water, it's pretty hard to work a fly, and with all there this we go, brush, fellas. that's beautiful. Nice fish, gorgeous, gorgeous fish. And he's kind of caught up real good. Easy boy, easy.
this is what it's all about. We put it back for somebody else to catch. There you go, big guy. Thank well, you. That's great. Now we used a variety of different gear on fishing for these brown trout on Bone Creek and uh, Gerald was using fly fishing gear and I was using spinning gear. I'm just going to go over some of, the, some of the techniques that we use and some of the equipment. I'm just using a, a five and a half or six and a half foot medium light spinning rod. I got it spooled with a six pound test. You could go a little lighter to four. There's a lot of snags here. So uh, six pound is probably more what you want. The fish aren't that big, but they can get into some terrible snags. Now, the fishing was slow in a, a lot of the time, and I went to a real slow presentation, just something very, very simple. I put on a plain hook and a night crawler. Cast this into the pools and let it sink to the bottom, and uh, the current would just carry it downstream a little bit, hoping to put it in front of those fish. You could use a grasshopper, a leech, just about anything. This sometimes is frowned upon by trout fishermen using live bait, but uh, it is effective and a lot of big fish are caught that way. Now it is possible to fly fish with a spinning rig as well. And what I've done here is I've hooked on a, a clear bobber about three feet up from, from my fly. You can see I've got the fly tied on here. Again, just a medium light six foot rod with six pound test, tied the fly on. I'll cast this upstream and let it drift down and the fly, this is a sinking fly, but a lot of times you can fish a dry fly as well. It'll float on top and the bobber will carry it down and it's just as effective as the fly rod and a little easier to handle with all the overgrown brush that we have. Now, when the conditions are nice and bright and sunny and the trout want a little more active bait, these fish feed on the surface a lot. Some of the other techniques that you can use that are very effective are little spinners like uh, MEPS and road runners. Uh, just got a little bit of feathers on there to cover up the hook. You don't need to use bait with these, just the, the spinner itself will, will uh, attract the fish. These fish can be really aggressive. When they're feeding, they're very aggressive. Probably the most common lure used in a spinning gear around here is a little spoon, a five of diamonds, Len Thompson, and a size seven or eight. Again, these, these fish are, are very active and they'll hit these baits quite hard. Uh, small floating crankbait something bright, something that's going to aggravate these fish to lash out and strike works very well. Again, cast, cast them downstream and work them up into the current works, works very well with the crankbaits. Or you can just go to a light jig. Now this is just a light little Northlands tube jig and you can work it real slow on the bottom and it'll imitate some of the insect life that these fish feed on and, uh, and all these methods are very effective. Just depends on the weather conditions, the time of day. The one thing, you have to be very sneaky. Be very careful. It's uh, the trout spook easy, and I think the biggest thing with them is, is to be careful sneaking up on them and take your time. Don't rush things. Well, Gerald, I'd like to thank you for all your help and showing me your uh, secret spots and, <laughs> and some of your techniques, and I've, I've learned a lot today, so thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Make sure you join us again next time on Gone Fishing.